welcome back to the Cover 3 podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Danny Cannell. I'm Chip Patterson. You see those sirens in your feed. You know exactly what that means. Emergency podcast as news broke on Tuesday morning that Virginia Tech was parting ways with head coach Justin Fuente. Fuente leaves the Hokies with a 40 Three and 31 record uh, across the six seasons, 28 and 20 in ACC play. Uh, and Virginia Tech is going to now you know, undergo the national search immediately. There's uh, a lot of different ways to attack this, of course, including what kind of candidates we think might be there for Virginia Tech, uh, the timing of the job as well, timing of the decision as well, you know. Bud Elliott, many more have mentioned on this podcast or reported that there was a December date that the buyout was going to drop for Justin Fuente. We said, well, we think Justin Fuente is gone, but we think it won't be until December. And so with this decision coming on November 16th, I wanted to ask, I mean, is is that mean it's $2.5 million for a recruiting class? Does that mean it's $2.5 million to not miss out on a coach? That was my first thought when I saw this Tuesday morning breaking news from Virginia Tech. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was surprised to it this morning too for the same reason. I think that's got to be, you know, they, they just they were trying to make the choice. What's more important? Do we try to get a coach in as soon as possible and save this recruiting class and give them enough time to you know finish it off and keep players and maybe add some new players, or do we wait till December, save some money, but possibly push the program back further a year or two depending on what the ramifications are and who the hire is and how long that process takes because i mean this is now a lot of open jobs and a lot of open good jobs like at power five schools in a year in which there isn't like a giant or obvious candidate or pool of candidates of available coaches that are be go they're going to be going to these jobs like jimbo pretty much as strongly as possible took himself off the market yesterday which kind of slows down that ripple effect but who knows maybe virginia tech has zoomed in on somebody honed it on them kind of has a deal in place and wants to get it done as quickly as possible how like that that's the thing i want like how many joey mcguires are out there that are going to leave a program before the season is over to go start get a head start like and maybe they exist maybe this becomes normal and if you get a great coordinator you can say yeah well Come join us now and start in that recruiting class. I mean, I, it's got to be what they're thinking, right? I mean, clearly the Miami news, they saw the athletic director gone. They're like, uh-oh, that's maybe a, um, a coaching candidate group that we would be pulling from the same candidate. So we want to get a head start there. If they make a move, we have to make a move. It's just insanity. Like, this is crazy. This is number 12 now, right? 12 mm -hmm. coach we've seen fired in the list probably is going to continue to grow. And I think you mentioned the like Tom, the fact that there isn't a like a really clear cut top three of okay, these are the guys. I think is going to make this fascinating. I think there's going to be a lot of fan bases. I don't know if Virginia Tech is in this one that are going to be like, we fired our guy because of that. Like for this guy, like that's where we're going. I think there's going to be some uninspiring hires that are made. And then you're just making moves to make moves. Now, I think Justin Fuente was at a point, we all agreed, we kind of came into this season, let's see what happened with Justin Fuente. Maybe the North Carolina win, maybe it felt like, okay, it's heading the right direction, but it has not translated. I think his tenure at in Blacksburg has been uninspiring. So I get the reason why we are where we are, but I just wonder where they're going to go and what direction. And is it going to be something that blows away the fan base? Although... I think anything would be kind of better than what you've been getting. Sure. And like, what are realistic expectations for the Virginia Tech program and what are realistic expectations for the hire? I think that right now are two different discussions because Virginia Tech fans are thinking about um, the fact that Justin Fuente had five or more losses in four straight seasons. And that for a program that from 2004 to 2011, the Hokies were in the AP poll at the end of the year every single year year now 2004 to 2011 that is the beginning of virginia tech's time in the acc it is also at a time when you know florida state was starting to take a step back and clemson had not taken off yet but even still i think that a virginia tech fan and someone within that program should expect that you should be flirting with the top 25 every year 
that you should be one of the three or four best programs in the ACC. And if you're winning five, if you're losing five or more games a year, you're not even coming close to that. So to make a change, I totally agree uh, with that line of thinking. Now you mentioned who are you going to get? Because I think that this move, while it might not be the hire that is made, I think that there's some text messages going on around Baton Rouge right now from LSU administrators. Because I think there's this one candidate down there in Lafayette who might occupy an interesting space between someone who LSU might think is the safety fallback hire and someone who Virginia Tech might think, hey, if we can get Billy Napier, like that would be a great opportunity, someone who could come in. What do we always hear about Napier? He's a culture guy. Right. And if there's a program that might need to latch on to that big buzzword of culture based on everything we've seen from Justin Fuente and this locker room and the personnel turnover from year to year, I think that making this move is signaling to Billy Napier. I think that making this move is signaling to Jamie Chadwell at Coastal Carolina. I think that making this move is kind of uh, inserting yourself into that conversation for some of these top candidates who might be more of a fallback for another program, but could be exactly the right fit at a place like Virginia Tech. All right, I want to put you on the spot. Chadwell or Napier, who do you want if you're Virginia Tech? Napier. Championships. And it was like a linear uh, trajectory of building over time. Chadwell's got a little bit of a smaller sample size. And it kind of felt like, a. I mean, much, much love to Jamie Chadwell. I think he's a very good coach. And also, I think he's got that Eastern Tennessee State so you think about Southwest Virginia, Eastern Tennessee, there's probably going to be some familiarity there. But Napier felt like it built up to championship contention while Grayson McCall landed, a good senior defensive line. Like Coastal, it was a little bit more circumstance. Again, that, I still respect Chadwell. Who do y'all think? I would take Napier. I think I think you nailed it on Napier. I think he would be the 1A, but I don't think Chadwell is that far behind. Like he would infuse a lot of like I think there's also it's kind of like dating when you go it's you know, you date one type of person and then you go exactly the other direction. Like to me, Justin Fuente, kind of boring, like pretty straightforward, not a ton of personality. You get a Chadwell in there, like that's going an entirely new direction. Like let's get some life in here. A young guy is going to have the mullet out there, the stash. Like it's a totally different direction. Although I do think either one of those, the fan base would be infused with a lot of life. Like I think they would both be applauding either one of those hires. So I really think if they get one of those, they couldn't go wrong. But I think Tom brings up a great point. Like what if you're Napier and you are that fallback option? This is like a high stakes game of poker. Like how long can you wait and say, well, LSU, I'm going to take this job if you don't give it to me. And LSU's like, well, we're still working on this. Can you wait? And it can get really, really interesting. And I think those those dominoes are going to have to fall sooner rather than later because everybody's in a race. So you texted the group. Uh, I, we might have even had this discussion just because, you know, it's Shane Beamer. But when you said Virginia Tech or South Carolina, was that with a hunch, a gut feel, any knowledge? Because I think that there's probably Virginia Tech fans who would love to see Shane Beamer come back to Blacksburg. South Carolina has exceeded expectations here in year one. And I, I don't know how much forgiveness there would be, but if Shane Beamer's that well liked, I mean, maybe there's at least enough goodwill to say, well, you know, he's he's going back to Blacksburg. There's enough emotional feels to it. Uh, do you think that Shane Beamer is going to be on the list of candidates that Virginia Tech, Whit Babcock, the athletic director, that he's going to get on the phone with him, someone who he probably has a great relationship with already, and say, hey, what do you think? I was more curious, just genuinely curious, because I do think it makes some sense. Uh, and then I thought it was really interesting. Like if you are Shane Beamer and you're, or you're his agent and you're advising him and you're looking at, all right, for the next 10, like where do you want to be somewhere for 10 years and possibly build some stability, which is almost impossible to do as we're learning in this landscape. Or let's say you want to win a conference championship within five, like five years. You want to try to, and maybe you parlay that into a bigger job. What place would be better for you? And it's funny because, but like if we would have talked after the Vanderbilt game, when South Carolina needed a game winning drive to win that game. And you would have asked this question. I think we all have been like, man, it's impossible to win at South Carolina. Like how tough is that to win there? You would have said, Oh, if I'm your agent telling Shane Beamer, Hey, if you have a good relationship with Whit Babcock, maybe you explore this option. Cause you can go there and maybe have a better opportunity to make inroads. 
So I think it's a more interesting question than it is, oh, I'm hearing anything. But I also wonder with Whip Babcock if he wants to kind of get away from that Bieber name. Say, man, if it get, if it gets uncomfortable, is it going to be hard for me to separate? And I also wonder if the fan base would be in you know enthused with that if they would be enthusiastic or they're thinking, oh, we're just trying to go after the Beamer name. Like I honestly just was more curious about Shane Beamer as a candidate and kind of all the implications that would go with it. Yeah, I mean, as far as comparing the two jobs. I think that they're kind of similar. It really just depends on what you're looking for. I think that they both obviously are at schools with that care about their football programs. They both have large fan bases who are passionate and fill up the stadium. Uh, the SEC, I think money is less of an option because they're willing to give you more of what you need. Whereas at Virginia Tech, one of the problems that they're facing and they've faced the last few years, and it's kind of similar to Miami, is they're not really paying their assistants nearly as much. If you look at the salary pool that they have for their assistants, it's kind of low in, compared to the rest of the ACC. And the facilities are good, but they're not, I don't know if they're to be considered top of the line in the ACC or any of that stuff. So I feel like there's some, some have advantages, some don't. South Carolina, you've probably got a tougher road to contention because you've got to play Clemson every year. You've got to play Texas A&M from the West every single year. So your schedule is never going to be easy. And at Virginia Tech, I feel like there's an easier path. So really, there's a whole lot of different influences, I think, that to determine which job would be better. So there's a, there is a coach who could come and hit the ground running. He just got dismissed from TCU. Gary yeah. Patterson could be introduced on Friday and immediately start recruiting. You know, it was interesting because I actually I talked to Clay Helton this morning for my radio show, and he referenced one of the massive advantages he had of getting fired from USC was being able to take the Georgia Southern job early. He's having time to scout his team, look at the personnel, kind of take his time, and then really target specifically on what they want to recruit and kind of hit the ground running. So. That's one of the like I think it I think, I think it'd be good. A ton of sense. I think it'd be great. Like if and yeah. if you're a Virginia Tech fan and you're not excited by that, I think man, you're a little bit delusional in that position. But I think that would be a hire that would make a lot of sense. And you could get out in front of the recruiting cycle. Mm. Any anyone else uh come to mind for Virginia Tech? Uh I mean, if you're Virginia Tech, do you go after Dave Clawson? Yeah. Oh, I mean, you at least have him on your list. Dave Clawson should be on the list of feel him out for any Power 5 job just because of the job that he's done right now. However, there are coaches who don't show up in on the hot lists that all the insiders put out, and it's because they don't really feel like being on the hot list or specifically their agent, if they even have an agent or lean on their agent for such things, doesn't isn't really out in that business. So... Yeah, I think you pick up the call and you reach out to Clawson or Clawson's representatives and you know sort of see where he's at. But I don't expect that to reach the point. How about this? I don't expect that reach to the point of final round of interviews. Yes, you reach out. I would not predict that that is uh, that's where Dave Clawson uh, leaves if he does end up leaving Wake Forest. Is this a job that Mike Elko finally takes? Like is, is Virginia Tech a big enough gig to pull him away, or is he going to wait for like an SEC job or something? I don't they know. Pay him a ton. He can use this for a raise. I guarantee you that because Texas A and M is, mm -hmm. you know, they're committed to Jimbo. We talked about that, and they got the top five recruiting class, and he's out there talking about it. They don't want to lose their defensive coordinator now. And I think if you're Elko, you might be able to wait and see what happens in another year. Like if you're patient, or I don't know. Baylor came open. If like there are some other opportunities, I think where he would say, "Let me pass on this one." Do you know? I don't have a good read on like Mike Elko and sort of like where he might be motivated or what his. Um, I mean, Wake Forest to Notre Dame, Notre Dame to Texas A and M. You know, being a part of that along with Warren Ruggiero, the offensive coordinator at Wake Forest, who I do think will potentially be uh, having some programs sniff around. I, I think Virginia Tech hiring Wake Forest OC is going to be a tough sell, especially yeah. when you've got a Billy Napier or a Jamie Chadwell or some other you know options out there. But I. I don't have an idea of where his uh, his motivations might lie in terms of us trying to uh, connect him to a job or a part of the country on the big board. But yeah, not him specifically, but like we were mentioning earlier in the show, some of these schools have to realize their fan bases better prepare themselves for 
hiring the Wake Forest offensive coordinator when you're thinking of somebody else, because like we were saying, there's a lot of open jobs and there's not a ton of obvious candidates for any of them. You know, based on the proximity, I would like if, if this has happened three years down the line and Marshall's won a conference USA title or two, I think Charles Huff would be a really interesting pick, especially for what he could do on the recruiting trail. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is the job that a Marcus Freeman would leave Notre Dame for. You know, there's there's a couple of uh, you know, if you want to go with the ace recruiter role as opposed to, you know, the the whiz not the wizard, but the um, you know, more the schematic football y type side of it. I think that those are probably two other names that you have to have on any power five list or potentially could. But I think that if I'm coming back to Napier or Chadwell, and if it's either one of those and I'm a Virginia Tech fan, I'm happy. Yeah, I think it's probably gonna be one of those two. In fact, I mean I would I would probably bet on it being Napier. I just think that he's he he knows he's not high on LSU's list and he probably has a good idea of what LSU's going to try to do and he doesn't want to sit there cuz like if you look at his team it's a very good team and he's done a great job of building that program but he's losing a lot of his top players after this season and there's no guarantee that he's going to be as attractive of an option at this time next year. So he might just be at the point where he's like, it is a power five job at a program with a good history that has shown it can win. I can't just sit here and wait around anymore. I got to go. Do you go before the end of the season? I hope not, but okay. I, I will not like it. Danny will not like it. You will not like it. We will get used to it. Cause I think it's going to start happening. And it's like, I don't at the same time, like the first coach that does it, probably doesn't like doing it either. It's just going to be a situation where you kind of have to, yeah. Because we talked about it at Joey McGuire, and you said, hey, it's about to happen with a head coach leaving one program to go take over another head coaching job. Uh, the remaining schedule for those interested, the Louisiana Raging Cajuns play Liberty. at Liberty this weekend, and then home uh, rivalry game against ULM. They have the conference – Oh, they yes. they they they, they wrapped they clinched that division up a long time ago. They are seven and zero. It is Texas State in second place at two and four. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's Danny. It is laughable. I'm not. I do not mean to revel in the uh, the lack of success from the Sun Belt West, but it is a startling conference title race uh, there in the West Division as the Cajuns have had it wrapped up. Which makes me think, like, if you are Billy Napier, I did my job clinch this division right. like y'all go enjoy enjoy the championship game enjoy the bowl game um yeah uh, the stuff. reason i knew liberty was on taps because i have the under the win total for our cover three win total <laughs> pot so <laughs> keeping a tight eye on that one <laughs> so, hey I'll, I'll carve out some time uh as we answer questions from the big old bag of mail uh to be able to maybe review some of our win totals and see what the stakes are uh speaking of shows that are upcoming no, tuesday night Instant reaction to the new college football playoff rankings. Wednesday, we are jumping into the big old bag of mail. Uh, and then on Thursday, 11 a.m., if you want to watch the taping live at youtube.com slash cover three, uh, make sure that you do that as well. That will be the locks to get you ready. You can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernell. You can follow him at Danny Cannell. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. See ya.